Okay, it looks like we have about 24 from the public. So that's very close to the number we expected. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, and welcome to this live presentation of the 27th Street Railroad Crossing Study. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lisa Gray, the Public Involvement Lead for HDR. Over the next two hours, members of the Montana Department of Transportation and HDR project team will share details of the study and respond to your questions and comments. We believe this open house and question and answer session will allow us to gather your input and provide the project team with information to design a better project. MDT is using online meetings to engage with the public rather than in-person meetings due to community health and safety concerns during the COVID-19 pandemic. We do look forward to meeting in person again in the future. During today's session, MDT and project team members will provide a project overview, present the alternatives, and discuss schedule and next steps. A question answer session will be held immediately following the presentation. Feel free to write your questions now or at any time during the presentation. In order to participate in the question answer session, locate the QA button on the bottom of your screen. Click the button, which is highlighted in green on the PowerPoint slide, and remember to hit send after you type your question. We cannot see your question unless you hit send. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and a copy of this meeting and the presentation will be posted on the project's webpage in the next several days. We ask you to invite your friends and neighbors who might be interested in the project to watch the video and fill out a comment form or send us an email if they have questions or comments. The project team consists of consultants working collaboratively with the department and include Rod Nelson, who is the MDT District Administrator for the Billings District, Mike Taylor, MDT District Engineering Services Supervisor, Kelly Williams, MDT Consultant Project Engineer, Tim Erickson, who is HDR's Project Manager, Stefan Streeter with HDR, HDR is part partnered with Dow's Doug Anderson, and you've already met me, Lisa Gray. I'll be your point of contact for the project. Now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Rod Nelson. Rod will take us through the project background and overview. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Rod Nelson. I'm the Billings District Administrator for the Montana Department of Transportation. Public involvement is a vital part of everything we do at MDT. So we are very appreciative of the opportunity today for sharing with you this very important project and you sharing with us your questions, comments, and concerns. Looking at the agenda for today's meeting, I wanted to start out by giving you a quick overview of the 27th Street Railroad Crossing Feasibility Study. Then Tim Erickson will be presenting in more detail the specifics of this very important project. The entire presentation should take about 20 minutes to complete, then we will open it up to questions and comments. Several years ago, a high-level high statewide study was completed identifying the railroad crossing on 27th Street in Billings as being a high priority for MDT. So a more detailed study is now being conducted to identify specific solutions that are fundable and meet the needs at this location. The intent is to develop a feasibility study to determine short and long-term solutions for the existing at-grade railroad crossing on 27th Street. So with that, Tim is going to speak with you in more detail about the 27th Street Railroad Crossing Feasibility Study. Again, please don't hesitate to write us with any questions, comments, or concerns. If you prefer, you can email the entire project team at any time after the meeting. The project team contact information will be shown at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Again, I'm Tim Erickson with HDR and wanted to go over uh, some of the study objectives. As Rod was alluding to, there was a previous study performed. In fact, there's been numerous studies over the past 50 plus years um, that several of you are probably well aware of that have looked at different uh, high level aspects of this project or of the, of the different crossings and especially with the 27th Street crossing. 
The 27th Street Crossing in downtown is one of the busiest railroad crossings in the state, which creates congestion, frustrated drivers, decreased downtown user experience, and impacts to emergency services. So this study of the 27th Street Act Parade Rail Crossing is a much more ground level study. The previous studies have been high level. Think of it like a 10,000 foot level looking down. This study, we wanna be on the ground. We wanna boots on the ground, turning over rocks, finding issues, finding uh, potential solutions, finding pros and cons to improving overall safety and mobility of this crossing for the public and the, and the entire community of Billings. As Rod mentioned, we want to identify short-term and long-term improvement solutions. So how we define those is a short-term improvement solution would be to leave the crossing as it is uh, with the roadway meeting the railroad at grade and making improvements to uh, signals, uh, to improving some ITS, which is intelligent transportation systems, or possibly even looking at uh, ways that we can just uh, work through as a community and with different technologies to improve overall safety mobility. Then the long-term improvement solutions are defined as a grade separation. So that would be to take roadway traffic either over or under the railroad tracks. Montana Rail Link, MRL, has been a key stakeholder from the beginning of this project. They have been included from the very beginning and MDT and MRL have both discussed this, this project at length as well as different stakeholder meetings that we have had. Several previous studies have looked at raising, lowering, or even moving the railroad tracks themselves. However, this project looks at what can be done to the overall public infrastructure to improve safety and mobility of the crossing. There's many fatal flaws associated with modifications to the, to the railroad itself. And this study will not touch the railroad. And that has been very clear from the onset of this with MRL as a key stakeholder from the beginning. Stakeholder and public input is very important to, this, to the success of this project and to the community of Billings as a whole. We have been actively meeting with neighborhood task forces, the Downtown Billings Alliance, Trailnet, Policy Coordinating Committee, and also today with our third public meeting. Ultimately, we, the stakeholder input is important to the success and we wanna find out what should and can be implemented in the future to improve safety and mobility for this crossing and for the community of Billings. So on the next slide, this study, uh, this, this slide shows where we have gotten to at this point. Uh, previous public meetings have discussed the different uh, alternatives that we have looked at. And this study has been going on for the past two or three years. So the overall first phase of the, of the project, which was identified during the, the first public meeting, was pretty much all the ideas were on the table. We wanted to review pros and cons, receive public and stakeholder feedback of what options could be possible and are they practical for this, for this phase here. So what you can see on the screen is what we are moving forward with for a short list of long-term alternatives. So again, the grade separations. A few of the other ideas that have been looked at during the first phase was taking all lanes, so the existing four lanes of traffic, either over or under the railroad tracks. The main reason those have not moved forward or were, were moved out of, this, out of the study in previous phases was that they, they sever the connectivity to the downtown, to the businesses, to the cross streets, and to the other parts of Billings. And as mentioned, we also had on as an option for looking at uh, improvements to the railroad tracks, either lowering or raising or moving. And that was a fatal flaw just purely from the uh, ability to look at only what the public infrastructure improvements could make there. So as we've moved along with the study, we've just added more data, found more information, again, the boots on the ground. We add more information in, turn the crank. Add more information in, turn the crank. And so what you see on the screen is where we are at with the long-term alternatives to identify, hopefully, a preferred alternative that's going to meet the needs of the community of Billings. Those two alternatives include a two-lane overpass and a two-lane tunnel. And I'll get into more details about that in future slides. So on the next slide, this identifies the current short-term alternatives being considered. As you can see, uh, signal modifications as well as ITS 
which stands for the Intelligent Transportation Systems, are all the ideas that are moving forward. In fact, signal modifications are already being implemented within the corridor. So the ongoing 27th Street project that has been under construction for the past couple construction seasons does include signal modifications at Montana Avenue and 27th Street, in particular for the southbound 27th Street traffic to turn left and have a dedicated left turn lane and arrow onto Montana, which will help as part of the signal modifications uh, for short term alternatives associated with this crossing. And with intelligent transportation systems, there are op opportunities to have additional advanced warning, uh, what's called variable message signs. So many signs that you might see in elsewhere in the country or along the interstate where it's a digital display that uh, can change those messages and let, let traffic and other users know when a train is approaching or when a train is crossing the tracks and to find alternative routes. On the next slide, you will see more detail about the long-term alternatives that are being considered at this time. So these are what is called typical sections. These are a slice of what the two-lane overpass or the two-lane tunnel could look like. On the upper part of the screen, the existing conditions shows two lanes of traffic in each direction, sidewalks on the outside, and different turn lanes down the middle. The overall extents of this project and where we have been reviewing uh, the focus of this project is from 3rd Avenue South to 3rd Avenue North. So that existing conditions generally uh, showcases what is on the ground today and that we all, all use for the 27th Street roadway. With a two-lane overpass, a single lane of, of traffic in each direction would go over the railroad tracks, as shown in the center, and a single lane of traffic in each direction would stay at grade. With the tunnel, a single lane of traffic in each direction would go under the railroad tracks, and similar to the other option, a single lane of traffic in each direction would stay at grade as well. A few things to note about this and the reasons that these alternatives have moved forward for the long-term improvement options is the traffic that wants to get either from the interstate to the airport, the hospital corridor, or vice versa, and get through the downtown area in a quicker manner and not wanting to access the rest of the connectivity that the downtown area provides. They can get onto the overpass or under in the tunnel and get out of the way and get and move through the move through the area efficiently. What this leaves is then the traffic, the pedestrians and other users that want to be in the downtown area, want to connect to the businesses, want to connect to the different side streets and cross streets uh, and connect to the areas of, of downtown where they want to be. It improves the overall user experience. One thing to note about the tunnel option is there are, as you may see in this typical section, and I'll explain a little bit more in, later as well, there are additional enhanced placemaking or bike ped opportunities with the tunnel. So what happens is the traffic that stays at grade or in, in similar to the current configuration, they can actually be moved to the center, which allows more room on the outside of the existing roadway to have placemaking, which could be boulevards or enhanced widened bike ped facilities, sidewalks, those sort of things uh, to improve the connectivity between Montana Avenue and First Avenue North in the downtown area for those users experiences. Also something to note, which has also been a question uh, at several of our stakeholder meetings and outreach efforts that have gone on so far, is the preliminary estimates of construction costs. At this time with preliminary estimates, the two lane overpass would cost approximately 35 to $40 million. And the two lane tunnel option would cost approximately $85 million. And that is in today's dollars. So there's no inflation included in that depending on when construction would actually occur. So the next group of slides shows some of the renderings that have been developed as part of this project that our team has put together to help visualize and showcase what could these options actually look like? So starting with the overpass option, this slide is a view of the overpass just south of the railroad tracks looking north. 
This shows how an overpass actually can provide opportunities for the placemaking that I mentioned under the structure. It is not directly shown in this rendering. However, uh, there are ongoing discussions and uh, discussions with stakeholders as well as development of an aesthetics committee where we want to get ideas on the table. Could there possibly be raised medians with landscaping? Could there be pedestrian connectivity opportunities underneath the overpass as traffic is, the local traffic is staying at grade on either side of, of the structure? This could be even an opportunity for uh, having pedestals to showcase artwork, local artwork and, and, and uh, statues and things like that um, that could be traded out, could uh, showcase at different times of the year, have different events. And there's even been ideas on the table such as having an opportunity for a farmer's market. So the importance of moving forward and again that stakeholder outreach and the input from the public is really important to find out what would the community want to see here? How could this benefit the community overall as well as improving the downtown connectivity and the safety and mobility of the crossing. The next image is a view from 2nd Avenue North looking to the south. So this area would be called what we would consider the touchdown point. So this would be where the overpass that is up above the railroad tracks then crosses over Montana and 1st Avenue North and then comes back down to grade around 2nd Avenue North. This, this image shows you how the traffic would need to divert where you would have a single lane of traffic in each direction that goes onto the overpass and a single lane of traffic in each direction that stays at grade. Further design and analysis will be needed to determine if all turning movements throughout all cross streets can be maintained. And the primary driver there is safety. And in particular, the sight distance. So what is defined as sight distance is the ability for a driver or users to safely see other vehicles or pedestrians to avoid conflicts. But at this time, the overpass option does allow access, um, maintained access on all cross streets with all current movements uh, as would be experienced at those intersections today. The next image is a view of the overpass standing at 1st Avenue North looking to the east. Again, this is a great example of how there's aesthetic opportunities and placemaking opportunities with the aesthetics uh, group that is, being de that is developed. To find out how, how could this structure really fit in and be a, a place that people wanna be and enhances the overall downtown area versus just a standard concrete structure that would be going through the downtown. So next we'll have uh, images of, of the tunnel option, some of the renderings that have been developed there. The first image is a view of the tunnel option from First Avenue South looking to the north. Similar to the overpass, uh, one of the overpass renderings, this shows the uh, touchdown point, if you will. This is where the tunnel would begin on the south end and how traffic would divert a single lane going underneath the railroad tracks in each direction in a single line of traffic staying at grade. The next image is a view of the tunnel standing south of the railroad tracks and looking to the north. And this is truly where the actual tunnel itself would start. Uh, in order to get under the tracks and over for that example, for that matter, a long enough approach needs to be constructed to get the vehicles low enough to provide proper clearances under the tracks. That area does need to stay open and then once the tunnel actually starts then the uh, that would be when traffic could start moving towards the center for those vehicles that are staying at grade crossing the railroad tracks as they do today. And finally in the third image of the tunnel this is at 2nd Avenue North looking to the south and in this view you can see some of the placemaking opportunities it's in the upper part of the screen Maybe a little bit more difficult to see, but in particular between Montana and First Avenue North, traffic does have the ability to move in towards the center, which then widens out the bike ped and other opportunities on the outside of the roadway. That provides those different opportunities for the various users within that area for connectivity to the businesses and connectivity to other parts of 
of buildings. Something else to note that you can see in this image is the overall cross street connectivity. So you can see directly with 2nd Avenue North, and it's also similar with Minnesota on the south side of the railroad tracks. With the tunnel option, both Minnesota and 2nd Avenue North would become right in, right out access as the tunnel grading required to get below the railroad tracks would not allow connectivity through those intersections. With the focus being on maintaining connectivity at 1st Avenue South, Montana Avenue, and 1st Avenue North. So as we look forward to the next steps of the overall study, again, this is our third public meeting being held today and very excited for everybody's participation. We, want, we are going to continue business and stakeholder outreach as the individual businesses and stakeholder groups have uh, very valuable input to help us develop and reach conclusions within the study. Again, we have developed an aesthetics committee with six to seven members from the different project stakeholders, as well as uh, a few of the stakeholder groups to discuss that aesthetics and placemaking opportunities for the project. What could this look like? How does the community want this to look? How can it be a place where people want to be in a showcase for buildings in the downtown? With all of that, the idea would be to determine a preferred alternative, primarily focused on a preferred long-term alternative that is best for the community. And the plan for that would be to identify that sometime in early 2021. And once that preferred alternative is developed, then preliminary design plans can be developed and prepared by the summer of 2021, which then allows MDT to determine funding opportunities and consider the project for programming into their fiscal planning into the future. So that concludes our presentation on the 27th Street Railroad Crossing. The contact information is shown on the screen as well as a website that is through MDT's website for this project in particular. And at this time, I'll turn that back over to Lisa for the question and answer period. Thank you, Rod and Tim. Uh, and we have some questions coming in already. That's great. As previously mentioned, MDT will use this public input to develop and refine the 27th Street Railroad Crossing project and we'll continue to work closely with the community and stakeholders. So we hope you will stay involved in the project. Remember, in order to participate in the question and answer session, please locate the QA button on the bottom of your screen, type in your questions, and click the send button. Okay, the first question is, for both options of the of overpass and underpass, would there be a need to remove any existing buildings around North 27th? Tim, you wanna take that? Sure, absolutely. And great question. Uh, for both the options, both the overpass on the, and the underpass, we are avoiding impacts to the extent that's possible. Um, so the, with what we have shown right now and what we have developed in our preliminary alternatives, there would be uh, no impacts to existing buildings along 27th Street. The area that needs additional, uh, additional boots on the ground information with survey and some other things would be the, uh, the property in the southwest quadrant of 2nd Avenue North and 27th Street. As there is a little bit of a grade change that would be required with the overpass option there, that there might be some opportunities to make sure that the access to the building can still be maintained and the grades can be met there. Um, with a little bit of additional engineering work there. Other than that one spot with the grades and the potential access to part of that building, there are no impacts to uh, existing buildings along 27th Street. Okay, next question. Will a pedestrian access to cross the tracks be built into either the bridge or tunnel? We need to make sure we get walkers and bikers across the tracks when the trains are present as well. I see lots of near misses with the pedestrians and trains on a daily basis from my office on Minnesota Avenue. So with the options and in particular for the two lane uh, long term solutions that are being presented, 
there is not an, a safe opportunity to get the pedestrians onto either the overpass or the tunnel, primarily because they would have to cross half of a street and then be with the live traffic going either over or under the tracks. So with this study and on 27th Street itself, there's not a plan for a great separation of the pedestrians. However, there are uh, still discussions about the potential, uh, I believe is at 25th Street, the pedestrian overpass there. And there could be consideration for a pedestrian overpass either at 20, 28th or 29th Street, um, if that was desired in the future uh, from the community. But as far as on 27th Street itself, the pedestrians would stay at grade. Okay, thank you. The next question is about traffic signals in the area. Um, the traffic signals have been upgraded and the state has never taken the simple act of programming the signals at 27th Street and Montana Avenue and perhaps other in intersections. To allow left turns onto Montana Avenue during train traffic and to create an extended period of green lights for north and southbound traffic following the passage of a train in order to flush out backed up traffic. Uh, I, I realize part of this was mentioned again today, but why doesn't the state make the simple computer program modification today? Tim, do you want to start that? Yeah, you bet. And Rod, feel free to, to chime in with any additional information that you have. So in regards to especially the uh, southbound 27th at Montana, um, that dedicated left turn, as was mentioned today, um, is installed. And one of the issues with the program, even though it does seem simple, is the overall ability for storage. Um, with the lane configurations and everything else, I believe there's only a storage for you know four or five vehicles in that southbound left turn. And so if there's enough through traffic that blocks up that left turn lane, then no matter how much green time during a train traffic is there, um, there's not a great option to be able to flush out a lot of that unless there is uh, a heavy movement of that southbound that decides to turn left instead of just waiting for the train. Rod, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Tim. And I think the other part of that equation and probably what that question is pertaining to um, really has to do with um, the fact that it is not a simple programming change. Otherwise, we definitely would. I drive through that area myself. I, I certainly understand what, why that question is being asked, um, but it's not a simple programming change. And the reason it isn't is because that entire downtown network of, of uh, signals for all the streets in downtown area um, are all coordinated together. And it isn't simple to just take one of those signals out of that entire network and say that it's going to do something different on a different time frame. It just is not simple to do. Otherwise, we would. Very good, thank you. So Tim, I'm gonna combine the next two um, questions for you into one. This is about both options. So which option deals better with snow and ice and heavy rains? And how will that affect travel, uh, especially winter and rainy seasons? How will travel be affected on both options because of inclement weather? You bet. So with an overpass, uh, I'll, I'll first start with uh, rain events. So with an overpass, uh, a drainage system uh, very commonly installed on several bridges would need to be installed that would pipe drainage off of the bridge and into the existing storm drain system within the downtown area on the roadway. Um, with a tunnel, the, the drainage is not as simple. Any rainwater and any other drainage that would end up in the tunnel area would actually have to be pumped. Uh, this is due to the um, high groundwater that exists currently. Um, as well as the existing storm drain system being uh, a higher elevation than would be the bottom of the underpass. And a pumping system is fairly common in, in uh, underpasses or tunnels, uh, similar to what's at uh, the 6th Avenue underpass as well as underpass in Laurel. Um, but they do, they do have an additional maintenance involved with those. Um, and if they uh, end up not working properly, there can be some, some additional issues and problems with that that can potentially close 
an underpass or a tunnel. In, in regards to ice and snow, that is definitely one of the considerations that uh, ongoing conversations with MDT and in particular their maintenance divisions would be for the overpass. So in, in order to remove the snow effectively and to reduce the opportunities for ice to form, how would that look? It might, it might require plowing to the center and removing. Um, so a larger snow event would, may require an overpass to be closed for a short amount of time. So that could be plowed and removed from the center and get off of the overpass. Uh, and that would avoid plowing. Obviously what we don't wanna do is plow snow to the outside, push it over the edge of the, edge of the overpass onto pedestrians or cars that are down below. And then okay. with the tunnel, the, the snow removal would be mainly on the, on the ends of that. Um, and some of that, uh, again, on those grades would just need to be proactively uh, managed. And again, with the conversations of the maintenance um, to be able to mitigate any potential icing issues there. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, I appreciate this next question because 18 wheelers are close to my heart. So Tim, this will go to you. Would 18 wheelers be able to go through the tunnel? So yes, the 18 wheelers, the, the way that uh, the design standards are uh, being developed for this project is to meet highway design standards. So highway legal vehicles would be able to traverse through the tunnel underneath the railroad tracks, which includes 18 wheelers. Uh, they would also be able to traverse the cross streets underneath the overpass as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, Tim, we'll start with you. Why is ITS only considered a short-term solution and not a permanent long-term solution? Technology in this area continues to advance as do interfaces in vehicles and driver assist features in vehicles. So the primary reason that ITS is considered in the short-term solution is that the categories of short-term and long-term for this study were defined for focused on the safety and mobility. So in particular to emergency services, um, there, are, there are a lot of great technological advancements that could be included and, and many more that we are probably not even aware of yet. However, that still does not eliminate the fact that that crossing could be blocked and it could increase times for emergency services in particular to be able to cross the tracks either to the south side or north side and have those dedicated routes. Um, this is really, this really became apparent with, uh, with outreach that we've had with the emergency services in town of knowing that they would have a dedicated crossing and not know that a train would be crossed there increases their confidence level of being able to serve all the residents of the community with any emergencies that may occur. And so that's the primary reason that it's considered short-term versus long-term is, is just the overall definition. Um, but there are definitely are some, some good ITS options that, that could exist that could improve the, the current situation. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim, with this next question, I, I assume the question is about um, operations, but it, it may be fair to take a minute and talk about construction too. So the question is, with both options, will traffic be maintained for both Montana Avenue and Minnesota Avenue? So traffic would be maintained on Montana Avenue for both options. Now during construction, there will definitely be some impacts depending on which option. Um, but but it, just assuming that this question is directed towards once the construction is completed, uh, Montana Avenue and First Avenue North and First Avenue South maintain full connectivity. With an overpass option, Minnesota Avenue does maintain connectivity across 27th Street as well. That is an intersection that some sight distance uh, things need to be looked at depending on the overall design of the overpass structure to make sure that there are safe movements that to be maintained, but it does allow for uh, movement across 27th Street, possibly with reduced uh, overhead clearances associated with that. With the tunnel option, uh, traffic across 27th Street on Minnesota Avenue is not practical. Uh, due to the grades that's required to get underneath the tracks. And so Minnesota would become a, a right in, right out at 27th Street. 
Okay, I think this has been answered, but I'm going to read it to you in case you want to add anything. Unclear from renderings whether, whether east-west traffic crossing 27th on Minnesota can be maintained. How does tunnel impact Minnesota local traffic? Yep, so that was uh, uh, similar to the last, yep. last question. So with the tunnel option, the east-west traffic would become right in, right out only, uh, meaning that they would not have access across 27th Street at Minnesota Avenue. Okay, the next question is how long would construction take and where do the funds come from? Sure, so construction on both alternatives would take, best guess, would take two years, uh, two full construction seasons. And with an overpass, uh, there are opportunities to maintain the local traffic for the majority of the duration of construction. Obviously, there will be times of construction that it's just not safe to have traveling public near the construction zone that might have to shut down 27th street for uh, shorter durations of time uh, and that would occur over a two-year period um, construction of the tunnel would likely require just due to the extensive impacts and utility relocations and other things associated with the tunnel construction uh, still would take two years pretty aggressive two years um, but would likely need to shut down 27th Street to traffic during that entire two year time frame. So the second part of the question is, where do the funds come from? So MDT has their, um, their transportation plan with their federal, primarily federally funded uh, buckets of money, if you will. And so the funding is identified through different priorities that they set forth in their five year plan. So at this time, this project is not in their five-year plan, so the funding itself has not been identified. However, the reason that uh, Rod alluded to at the beginning of this presentation is that they want to see what is a practicable solution long-term for the community of Billings. And once that is identified, then they would, uh, MDT would look for those different funding sources and what funding could be available and program a project as appropriate into their funding mechanisms that would be available in the future. Okay, thank you. The next question, the aesthetics committee is a nice gesture, but how realistic is it to generate pedestrian amenities in the middle of a state highway, excuse me, a state highway concrete superstructure? That, that will be decided with uh, some of the input from the aesthetics committee. Um, you know, there's, it does seem that uh, just, just plopping down a pedestrian facility right through the middle um, may or may not seem like the most logical thing. And there's, there's a lot of different ideas that are being brainstormed. And so um, safety is first and foremost with projects that are designed and projects that move forward. And if it's uh, just doesn't seem like a realistic or a safe opportunity there, then uh, other options uh, for improving aesthetics could be explored. And Tim, that would be something we'd be willing to, to, to bring back to the public after we get uh, the aesthetics committee um, produces some plans. Is that accurate? Yes, definitely. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, next question. Concerning the tunnel with only one lane each way, what provisions will be made to extract a stuck vehicle? This is especially important for emergency vehicles such as ambulances and fire trucks. Mm -hmm. So the overall length of a tunnel, um, and this would be for the overpass or the tunnel option, um, just due to the overall usable width. Um, but there is the balance and, and part of the overall uh, engineering that still needs to go into this in future phases would be to look at uh, what width and what probability would that occur um, because there could be um, a vehicle that could get stuck could break down could be an accident um, and those sort of things occur with with overpasses and also tunnels um, or underpasses uh, throughout montana and throughout the United States. Um, and so looking at those options of whether it could be some uh, areas or the whole the whole area could have, the whole tunnel could have a little bit wide, wider shoulders, so at least a single lane of traffic for sure will get around um, and maneuver those safely and be able to extract those, those uh, vehicles if there is a situation that occurs. 
Um, that's definitely something that we want to talk further with emergency services as well as MDT maintenance on of, of what is practical and, and also taking, you know, maybe what is seen at uh, some of the other overpasses or underpasses throughout the state and, and um, take some lessons learned from that. Okay. Was an option considered to force southbound traffic east on Montana to a different crossing point, maybe an overpass further east? So as far as moving actual 27th Street traffic um, in a permanent detour further to the east, that, that option has not been considered. Um, the consideration of moving southbound traffic onto Montana has to do with that signal improvements. Um, but again, the, the additional storage length or the, uh, I should say the lack of available storage length and other things to be able to force traffic um, over to say either 21st or 13th underpasses um, isn't practical as, as far as the impacts that it has to other turning movements and other traffic movements in the downtown area. Thank you. Um, the next question is about the concern of pedestrian crossing being a part of this project, not in addition to it. They're, they're asking the team to please reconsider including the pedestrian cro crossing because uh, many low income individuals on the south side do not have vehicles and need access to downtown for work and food and medical care. That's a great comment and take that into consideration as the project moves forward. Okay, thank you. Um, what type of funding will be available for this state federal MRL? So the funding that, and, and Rod, feel free to chime in, um, but the funding that's primarily available would be federal funding. Um, so the majority of MDT's funding for most of their capital improvement projects, uh, large infrastructure projects, is through federal funding. Um, and other examples of federal funding could be grant opportunities as well. Um, so the, as far as uh, MRL participation, uh, future discussions would have to happen between MDT and MRL of, of whether there's Im improvements enough made to the existing crossing that uh, there could be participation from MRL, but at this time the focus would be for uh, finding available funding, which would be um, from federal funding as well as grant opportunities that could, uh, could be available for this project. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tim, the next question is about um, the railroad's participation and whether they could do more um, to avoid some of the roadway blocks. Um, and what is the railroad's solution, if you will, being considered as part of the short term options? So as part of this project, we have had conversations with Montana Rail Link and, and asked if there was opportunities for improvements, either the switching operations or something else to help alleviate some of the crossing concerns. And, and simply put, um, you know, Montana Rail Link, they, um, they do as, as efficient of operations as possible. They know that there's safety concerns in general at any at grade crossing and they don't uh, deliberately try and block crossings at all and and they feel that they're as part of this project that there's not any improvement opportunities for the switching so again we're we're focused on the on what can be done to the public infrastructure here to improve the overall safety and mobility of the users of the crossing thank you so um, this question is taking us back to the southwest corner of Second Avenue. Um, would you elaborate on the grade issues? And then there's a second question about um, long-term term noise pollution impacts 
on the hotels and lofts located near North 27th. So the first is about grade issues and the second is about noise. Sure. So in regards to the grade issues, um, it's primarily in, in what was referred to as the touchdown points. Uh, so just making sure that the various grades uh, focused on the roadway itself uh, meet the requirements for safe, safe maneuvering of vehicles as well as pedestrians. And what we have shown with our preliminary study at this point, the preliminary engineering that has gone into it is that there is a, uh, in front of the uh, building on the southwest corner of 2nd Avenue North and 27th Street, there could be a, a couple feet of grade differential between the existing sidewalk and the different grades that need to need to come off of that intersection in order to uh, meet those design criteria for for that touchdown point. Uh, so with that, knowing that there is, I believe off the top of my head, um, there is an access to the, the building itself right off of 27th Street. And so that would be the main concern is that is that access into that building right off of 27th Street. Um, you know, retaining walls and ramps and other things are opportunities. It's just that actual level of engineering has not been put on the paper yet for determining what could be done there, as well as discussions with that uh, property owner to determine uh, what concerns or, or um, improvement options may or may not be available for that. So as part of the second part of that question, the long-term noise pollution effects of the hotel rooms and lofts located on North 27th Street. Um, we have, as part of the study, we have performed a noise analysis, a pretty detailed noise analysis. And that information, uh, at least the exhibits, was presented at our second public meeting. And that information is available on the project's website through MDT's website. And what that, what that showed, um, because noise receptors were actually uh, placed in various parts of, um, in particular, the, uh, the Doubletree Hotel, as well as the Northern Hotel, um, to showcase how the different noise levels could happen in, in you know, three levels up, five levels up, uh, up along there. And what was really interesting, it was actually um, pretty eye-opening for our entire design team and, and uh, team that's been working on this, is that compared to the no-build solution, which would be to do nothing at the railroad crossing, um, the noise levels and decibels at the um, higher up on those hotels actually was reduced compared to the no build for both the overpass and the underpass. And I'd say the easiest way to explain that, um, those results is that with a tunnel, you have a portion of the traffic that is being diverted underground, if you will. And so that noise is being blocked from coming up and you have a reduced amount of traffic staying at grade. With the overpass, you have a portion of the traffic being moved up above and a portion that's staying at grade. And the portion that's staying at grade, those noises, those noise levels are actually being blocked by the overpass. And so the amount of traffic that stays or that, that could be used on the overpass produces a, a lower amount of, of noise pollution, if you will, uh, for those adjacent properties. And again, that information is shown with an exhibit uh, on that uh, project website. Thank you, Tim. Okay, I have a, a quick comment question. Um, I sent a message back to someone because I didn't understand their question. So if you would like to rewrite the question and send it to me real quick, that'd be great. If you would rather not, please feel free to send me an email um, at lisa.gray at hdrinc.com. It's on the PowerPoint slide. Um, because I, I want to make sure that we get your answered question, your question answered. Uh, and we only have two more questions. So if anybody has any questions that they're pondering and writing down this into us, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Okay, the next question is, with the overpass, will there be a left turn lane from 27th Street to Montana? Yes, there would, in both directions. Thank you. And my last question for now is, has any independent study been done regarding the effects of either option as it pertains to maintaining 
a cohesive downtown environment. The concern is that neither or either project not be detrimental to downtown. So to my knowledge, uh, an independent study has not been done to that. Um, and uh, just based on the outreach and efforts that we've been doing, that that's what we want to determine is if there are things that show that it could be detrimental to downtown. Um, but to our knowledge, there's not been an independent study and, and any awareness of, of if this could be detrimental to the downtown as opposed to the benefits that come from the safety and mobility of improvements of this, at this crossing. Okay, that is the last question that we have open right now. Um, feel free to take a minute if you would, write, would like to write another question to us, that would be great. In the meantime, I'm going to thank you all for um, your time. We realize that everybody's got really busy, crazy days now, so we appreciate your brain power and your um, time. And I would turn it over to Rod if he wanted to do a, a, a quick thank you um, before we go. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And yes, absolutely. Thank you to everyone who joined us today, asked questions, comments. Um, once again, um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, please feel free at any particular point in time. You, you have the contact information there in front of you on the screen. Um, please send it to us. Uh, we really do want to hear from you. So thank you.